So we've had a big build-up, right? We've taken a look at what politics is, what political science is, and then we did some of this background, and we looked at the philosophy leading up to the American Constitution the, and the Revolutionary Era and the, and the Constitutional Convention, some of the key portions of the Constitution. And now it's time to start taking a look at the institutions, one at a time, that come out of the framing document. And one of the things that we're going to have to understand is, is that institutions are not static. Institutions, they change, they evolve. And so what we're going to look, and we're going to begin with Congress, we're going to look at their trajectory, the way they've shifted and changed and moved through time. And that's a big deal, and that's going to be kind of interesting. And it's going to take us a couple of mini lectures for each of our institutions, but we're going to start with Congress, and then we're going to move on to the presidency, and then we're going to do uh, the courts. And I think most of you kind of... Uh, a basic idea of Congress the same way that Mark Twain did. And Mark Twain said, uh, writing to a reader once, Reader, suppose you were an idiot, and suppose you were a member of Congress, but I repeat myself. In other words, you've got to be stupid, idiotic, uh, to be a member of Congress. You've got to do weird and bizarre things. And one of the, what I'm hoping to kind of take away, one of the things I want you to take away is, is that it's not just idiots or crooks <laughs> who are in Congress. As a matter of fact, it's the institution that ends up making what it is. And the other thing that I want to point out uh, to you is that this is a branch that the beginning, as we saw at the end uh, in the Constitution, it's Article 1. It was the branch considered the most important by the framers. But this really doesn't uh, exist anymore. Today, the presidency is actually the dominant branch of government. And this has been a big change and a big shift over time. So let's briefly overview uh, Congress. As we've already talked about earlier, it's empowered by Article 1. And it's going to get some important powers in Article 1 that we want to get a little bit more deep into. One is, is that Article 1, Section 8, that's that section you should have read that we've talked about, it gets the sole legislative power. That means uh, that nowhere else, no other institution can pass laws. Only Congress can pass laws. The other thing that's going to make uh, Congress unique is it's never the expression of one party. And that's a really big deal because this is very uniquely uh, an American phenomenon. If you go to other countries, most other countries, when a party wins an election, what it means is it wins all of government. But in the United States, this is never, simply never, the case. The minority party always has power. We talk, we've seen this in the Federalist Papers, Federalist Paper number 10 specifically, right? this idea that minorities should be able to block majorities. <clears throat> and Congress represents this. The other thing that makes our Congress unique is the fact that its very structure allows for member independence. That means that individual members of Congress have a lot of power or that they matter. And this is also unique from other countries where it's really more about the parties and less about the individuals. But here, it's going to be about those individuals themselves. And that's going to be the key element uh, for Congress. Now, how does this all end up playing out? Well, in Congress, unlike many other world systems that are based on what's called proportional representation, individual members of Congress are responsible because they're elected by a group, by their constituency. And this is a huge deal. A constituency are the people. It's the district and the people that make up that district or that area where an official is, is elected. So it's this geographic boundary, and everybody who lives there end up voting, and the people that they vote for end up giving them one representative. 
that representative's district, that location, is their constituency. Now, this is a big deal because it means that in the United States, individual members of Congress have to think in terms of their district or their constituency. And there's really two different ways you can think about how you might represent somebody. Um, and those two models are the trustee model and the delegate model. Now, in the delegate model, this is straightforward, this, a representative in this situation says they see themselves as representing the will of the constituency. So in other words, the delegate, the representative, should do whatever the group of people in his or her constituency would do if they were uh, there. Think of it as kind of the, the will of the people. The other way that you can uh, think about uh, your constituency is a trustee model. In other words, you're not going to try to do exactly what all of them do, but you're going to try to make the best decisions from your point of view. Because your point of view might be better than theirs. As a matter of fact, your position might allow you to have a better understanding of it. And both of these models uh, can have positives and negatives, right? The delegate model, you can say, ah, well, you're doing what people would do in your behalf. But of course, the criticism of this is, ah, I'm just seeing where the wind blows, right? I'm going to do whatever is popular. On the other hand, if you don't always do what's popular, if you, if you do the trustee model and say, look, trust me, I'm going to do the best thing, uh, people say, well, he's isolated. He's part of Washington. He doesn't understand us anymore, right? And so most representatives have to kind of deal along this line, and that's because all of Congress is a representative body, and all of those members have, uh, at base, a constituency. Now... In our Congress, our Congress is composed of two bodies, a House and a Senate. And I'm sure that you're probably familiar with these two. Now, in our case, the House and the Senate are not equal. Uh, we have a Senate, which is the upper chamber, and we have a House, which is the lower chamber. Now, that doesn't mean uh, that it's better or worse. No, rather, it's just a reflection of how close they are to the people. There's going to be... The House is actually a larger body. As a result, that means that each of those constituencies we're talking about is smaller. Right? So they're closer to the people in that sense. Uh, there are 435 House members. On the other hand, there are 100 senators. It's a smaller body. And so, as a result, the number of people that they represent is much larger. Now, so we have 100, 2 for each state, and we have House members that are based on, uh, oh, excuse me, on population. There will also be some other unique differences um, between the House and the Senate, and it's going to give it its very unique perspective. In the House, um, members have to have been citizens for seven years, and in the Senate, nine years, so much longer term in the Senate. Now, we haven't gotten here yet, but just so you know, presidents have to be natural-born citizens. They can't have immigrated the way House and Senators can. But now here's the big deal. House members are only elected for two years, while senators are elected for six years. This is a much bigger deal than you would think. It actually gives the whole tone and tenor of both of these bodies very different. House members are constantly focused on re-election. And they have to be. Because by the time they get into office, it's barely enough time to get anything passed before they have to go up for re-election. So it's this kind of hectic body. As a matter of fact, if you're there, if you're in person, um, it's, things are happening and people are running around and the staffs are all uh, kind of busy and crazy. But if you go over to the Senate side of Congress, well, if you're looking at from the back or the visitor entrance side, which is going to be on your right, it's going to be a whole different ballgame. It's going to be this very calm, kind of 
elevator music in the background, much larger offices, because there's fewer of them. Because, uh, to put this in perspective, how long six years is. So if you begin your college career when uh, there's an election, let's assume you're electing both a House member or a senator, you will elect that House member uh, two more times during the course of your college career if you go the normal four years. However, if you elect a senator at the very beginning of your college career, you will graduate from college. You could still get your master's and be a year into your Ph.D. before there would be an election for a senator again. This is a very long time. The other, as we had already said, is this larger and smaller constituencies. House numbers on house members on average are representing about 700,000 citizens. It's not perfect, but it's about 700,000 citizens, and we'll learn more about why in just a little bit. Senators, on the other hand, are fixed. That means it doesn't matter how big or small the state, uh, the state or the population is. There are always two per state. So. This means that the geographic constituency for the House is there are districts, and we'll have to learn how those districts come about, and the geographic constituencies for senators, which is not probably a big shock, are states. The other little difference between both is that House members are there, uh, have to be at least 25, so there might be a number of you out there who uh, meet that. Uh, senators have to be at least 30. I'm sure there's probably fewer of you who are going to meet that. They also have some of their own unique powers. So House members, as we already noted earlier in another mini -re lecture, they always have to originate the re uh, revenue bills and they get impeachment charges. The Senate gets a whole big bag of things that we call advice and consent. Uh, presidential nominations, um, treaties, There's a number of instances where the Senate has to offer what the Constitution calls advice and consent. And what this basically means is it votes on things that typically the president is uh, approving. And that includes things like treaties, appointments, nominations, etc. Um, uh, the House does not get to be involved in this. And as we already noted, they get to try impeachment cases. Now... House members, every two years, the entire House goes up for an election. So every two years, we have House elections. And this is an election for everyone. Every member of the House is going up in that two-year time frame. Not so for the Senate. To make the Senate an even more uh, calm and even a more... Um, slow deliberating, cooling mechanism to the House's hot bubbling tem temperament. The whole Senate only goes up for an election, does never goes up for a whole election, but rather only one third of it goes up for an election at a time. So let's assume we have the senators, one third of the senators go up for an election, two years elapses, the second third goes up for an election. Two more years elapses, or now we've hit four years total. And the third goes up for an election. Then finally, two more years elapses for a total of six years, and we're finally back to the first third. So in other words, each third is, all, is getting elected every three years, right? So if we started uh, here, for instance, right? One, two, three, four, five, six or if you were the third third. One, two, three, four, five, six. So there's always six years for that third, but the whole Senate's never going up. So even if everybody wanted to throw all the senators out, they couldn't do it in any one given election. They'd have to wait for six years. So we're going to pause here. Uh, we've kind of learned the setup and the general background of the Senate. And in the next section, we're going to start tackling uh, how the processes of elections and those constituencies for House members.